You're now listening to episode 40 of the Real Estate CPA Podcast. Your source for all things real estate, accounting, and tax. Here, we reveal our secrets that can save you thousands in taxes, streamline your accounting process, and help grow your business. Stay tuned to hear insightful interviews with industry experts, successful real estate investors, and current clients on what strategies they use to grow their business and how they steer clear of Uncle Sam. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Tom Caselli here today with syndication attorney Kim Lisa Taylor to discuss just about everything you need to know about syndication law, including when an offering becomes a security, rules for selling securities, accredited versus sophisticated investors, syndication structures, and much more. Kim Lisa Taylor Esquire is founder of the Syndication Attorneys, a boutique corporate securities firm that helps clients nationwide with their federal real estate securities offerings. Kim and other members of the Syndication Attorneys focus on helping small business owners and developers structure and convey their investment opportunities in a way that will attract private investors, both domestic and foreign. Before we jump right into today's episode, I want to remind you about our virtual, oh, not going to remind you about our virtual workshops today, but if you haven't checked one out, you definitely want to because we've already helped save multiple real estate investors a few thousand dollars just by attending the virtual workshop. Instead, today, I want to let you know that we have other content available outside of our podcast. If you head on over to therealestatecpa.com, you'll find our blog that has a ton of posts on some very useful accounting and tax tips. In fact, one of those posts is a step-by-step walkthrough on how to fill out Schedule E, which is the area of your tax returns where you report your real estate investments. So if you're going to be doing your own tax returns this year, that's definitely a guide you want to check out. Again, you can find that at therealestatecpa.com. I also want to let you know that we do have a YouTube channel. You can find it by going to YouTube and searching for The Real Estate CPA, and we should be one of the first options that pops up. And if you haven't already subscribed, you definitely want to do that because we'll be releasing a ton of real estate tax and accounting content over the next year and something you won't want to miss. And without further ado, we'll jump right into today's episode. We have Kim Lisa Taylor, an attorney with the syndication attorneys. Uh, She has been doing syndication law for some time now. She's going to go ahead and give us all her insights into what you need to know and uh, what you need to do um, when you're going to be doing a syndication. Kim, would you mind giving our audience a little bit of a background into your story and how you got started in the real estate space and how you got to where you are today? I started out my career as a professional geologist. So I I still hold the license as a professional geologist in California. But during the course of that, I actually did some work for the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And I really kind of got interested in uh, multifamily housing and how the whole investing world worked through that uh, experience. And later on in life, my husband and I started looking at how we could step up our investments. We had some single family stuff and decided we wanted to you know, step up into the world of uh, multifamily. So we went to some training seminars and learned how, got a coach and uh, met my law partner who was doing uh, syndication work at the time, my original law partner. And uh, he and I started a firm, since then gone on to become an attorney. So I decided that this was a really cool area of the law, and I liked it a lot. Um, He and I started a firm. I worked with him for a long time, and then uh, two and a half years ago, set off on my own and uh, set up my Florida uh, law firm, Syndication Attorneys. Interesting story. So what particularly excited you about real estate or real estate law? Was it just because you you had a passion for real estate, or did you kind of just fall into it? I had a passion for real estate. And the thing I liked about syndication was that prior to that, as an attorney, I had been doing litigation. And I found out that I really wasn't suited for doing litigation. I really liked helping people put deals together a lot more than I liked uh, you know, fighting about deals that fell apart. So I decided I'd kind of rather go into the transactional side of things. And I liked securities work a lot. It was a really pretty cool niche and uh, gave me an opportunity to go out and teach and speak and travel around the country and meet a lot of really cool real estate investors. So that's where I ended up. Awesome. Awesome. It sounds like a great journey. Could you tell our listeners right now a little bit about what a security is? Sure. So the 1933 Securities Act is what defined securities as we know them today. And two things that pertain to real estate investors are uh, the first thing on, in the definitions of securities is promissory notes. And then later on down in the list, there's a big long list of things that are securities. Later on in the list is something called an investment contract. 
So an investment contract wasn't really well defined when the 1933 Securities Act was written, but it was subsequently defined in 1946 uh, with some case law involving some people who had invested in an orange grove actually here in Florida, you know, an hour and a half or so from where, where I am, in a place called Howie in the Hills. So they had invested in this orange grove with the idea that the orange grove operator was going to continue to harvest the oranges and share the profits with them. At some point, the uh, operator said, well, we're not going to do it anymore. And, uh, you know, here's your tree, here's your uh, plot of land, whatever. And, and the investor said, no, that's not what we bought. And so it ended up going all the way to the Supreme Court where they finally said, okay, this is an investment contract. And here's the elements that are going to define what that is. And so they, what they came up with is anytime you have an investment of money in a common enterprise with an expectation of profits based solely on the efforts of the promoter, then you have created this investment contract. So translated into plain English, that means if you're selling interests in a company and to passive investors where you're going to be taking control of their money, they're relying on you to generate the profit for them. They're not actively involved in generating their own profit, uh, then you have created this investment contract. So if I were to say, go with a buddy, a uh, buddy of mine were both to be, say, general partners, take an active role and do a flip together, that would not be an investment contract because we're both actively working? That's right. Because you're both staying actively involved in generating your own profit. Neither one of you is relying on the other to generate that profit. But if your buddy said to you, hey, I'm busy. I got a job. I'm going to give you 100K. Go out and invest it. And you know, just send me checks whenever you make a profit. That would change it into that investment contract. And at that point, that's when I would need to start dealing with all of these securities, these securities laws and things around like that. Yeah. So what happens is, all right, so now you know you're selling securities. You have to figure out how to comply with securities laws. So if you're selling securities, the securities either have, according to the 1933 Securities Act, the securities either have to be registered with the uh, regulatory agency, when that means they have to be pre-approved. They'll look at what you're doing, you know, give you a bunch of comments, go back and forth, uh, and then finally let you go ahead and sell the securities. That's the whole process of going public, um, doing initial public offerings like Facebook did or Google did. The alternative to that is, you know, you're not going to do that if you've got a property that you have to close on in 60 to 90 days. You're going to have to find an alternative to that. So if you can't register the securities and and take the time to get them pre-approved before you can sell them, then you have to qualify for an exemption from registration. So there are several different exemptions from registration. Each one of them has a distinct set of rules that you have to follow. So I like to say they're kind of like tax deductions, right? If you claim a tax deduction on your taxes, you're entitled to claim it unless the IRS comes and audits you. And then they're going to say, you got to show us how you're entitled to this deduction. And if you can't prove how you're entitled to it, they're going to take it away. Same thing with the securities exemption that's self-executing. You have to prove how you followed it. You have to keep records to show how you followed it. There is some filings that have to be done at the federal and uh, state level if you're following a federal exemption that would uh, show how you, you know, actually complied with the rules of that exemption. So if you're ever asked by a regulator, then you would be able to document and show, hey, I followed it. These are all the rules that I, you know, that I picked and these are the rules that I followed. Awesome. So we do know that there's 506B and 506C, which are part of these regulations. Before we get right into that, I think there's uh, maybe we could preface that with, you know, there's two different types of investors that can invest in a lot of these offerings. One of them is an accredited investor and the other one would be a sophisticated investor. Could you give us a quick overview of what an accredited investor is and how it differs from a sophisticated investor? Well, so actually what there are is there's accredited and non-accredited and then there's sophisticated. And the thinking on this has shifted a little bit because of some guidance that the SEC gave out in the last uh, year or so. So the accredited investor is purely a financial qualification. So that says if you make over $200,000 a year income if you're single or $300,000 a year if you're a married couple, and that's been for the last two years with an expectation it will continue into the future, then you meet the income requirement. The alternative to the income requirement is if you don't meet the income requirement, or even if you do, if you have a million dollars net worth, uh, excluding any equity in your primary residence. So I call this the one, two, three rule. You either have to have a million dollars net worth, or you have to have 
meet one of those income requirements, $200,000 of single, $300,000 if married. So that's the financial definition of accredited. Non-accredited is everybody else who doesn't meet that financial qualification. But then sophisticated is something that's even slightly different than that. Sophisticated just means that you have either by yourself or with the help of your investment advisor, the ability to evaluate the merits and risks of an investment based on your educational or financial background. So you have to be able to show that you're sophisticated. So there's certain exemptions. So, you know, this is getting into kind of these, some of the rules of these exemptions. There's certain exemptions that require that you either are accredited or maybe you have to be sophisticated or we can get into those a little bit. So could you tell us about these exemptions? I think 506B and 506C are are some common exemptions that people use or common rules that people use. Yeah. So the, the rules that you're talking about, these are, this is called Regulation D, Rule 506, okay? And that is one of these exemptions. So just a few minutes ago, we said, hey, if you're selling securities, they either have to be registered or they have to be exempt from registration. And if you're going to try to make an exempt from registration, then you have to pick which exemption you're going to follow and you have to follow its rules. So Regulation D, Rule 506 has two sets of rules that you can choose from. These are both federal rules. These are by far the most popular exemptions that are in use today across the country. And the reason is because they preempt state laws. Um, States also have their own securities exemptions, which you could use if you and the property and every one of your investors was all in the state where you're located, then you could perhaps follow one of these intrastate exemptions instead of trying to qualify for a federal exemption. But if you're going to be crossing state lines, say, for instance, you're buying property in another state or your investors are coming from multiple states, then you probably would prefer to use the federal exemption because it's going to preempt individual state laws, which might be different and they're slightly different in each state. And it could be hard for you to comply with multiple states, different nuances. Um, So the federal rule, Regulation D Rule 506B, be like boy. That is the original rule. It's been in effect since the 1980s. It allows you to raise an unlimited amount of money from an unlimited number of accredited investors and up to 35 non-accredited investors. All of the investors must be sophisticated. So not just your non-accredited investors, also your accredited investors must be sophisticated. But you can't find these investors through any means of general advertising or solicitation. So this is the friends and family exemption. This is for you to go to people that you already have substantive pre-existing relationships, talk to them one-on-one, explain to them what you're doing, see if they might be interested in investing with you. So that's the Reg D rule 506B. So 506C just came out a few years ago with the JOBS Act. And what that allowed is they kind of relaxed the standard a little bit and said, well, okay, we'll allow you to advertise as long as you are reasonably assured that the only people that invest with you are accredited investors. So they kind of took away that uh, further requirement of sophistication. They took away the prohibition against advertising, but they said you can only have accredited investors. And not only do they have to be accredited, they actually have to go through some verification process. In the 506B rule, the investors can self-certify by checking some boxes on some forms saying, yes, I meet this criteria. And as long as you don't know anything different about them, you're free to rely on that. But in the 506C, you actually have to have some reasonable assurance that they are accredited. So usually that's going to come in the form of a letter from their CPA, their attorney, their registered investment advisor, somebody with a license who's actually looked at their financials and uh, determined that they're accredited. And that has to have been done within 90 days of when they're actually making the investment. Yeah, we end up actually filling out a lot of these forms for investors for the 506C offerings. So we're very familiar with those. When it comes to uh, substantiating these positions, is there anything that you recommend your clients to use to substantiate the fact that they actually know someone is sophisticated? Or is that just something that it's solely on the judgment of the syndicator or of the person who's offering it. Yeah, so the sophistication, what the SEC has said is when it comes to qualifying people for 506B offerings and to make sure that they're sufficiently sophisticated, then you should be having some conversations with them about their financial situation. 
first before you start making offers to them, you should already know enough about them to know whether they're accredited or non-accredited. So, you know, that's kind of the beginning of the pre-existing relationship is already knowing that information. And then you should be asking them about their investing goals. You know, what are they looking for in an investment? What kind of time horizon are they interested in being invested for? What other things have they invested in? And just getting a sense and a feel for whether they're a good fit for the kinds of things that you might have to offer. But I'll also say that there's a component of that conversation that eludes a lot of people. And it's really the most important thing. And it's like, it's not only are you qualifying that investor to find out if they can invest with you, you should be talking to them to find out if you want them to invest with you. Because there are you know, certainly some personalities that might not be a good match for you and uh, you know, some you know, nervous investors or uh, you know, people who are maybe just too abrasive or confrontational, you know, things like that, or people that are asking you, you know, 5 million questions up front and taking up a lot of your time they might not be the best people to put in your deals. And so you really need to be taking some time to get to know those people well enough to know whether you want them in your deals as much as you want to know whether they're sophisticated. That's absolutely true. Uh, You know, I've invested in a few syndicates, myself as a limited partner, and my mentor tells me about all these people he, you know, he regrets letting in because they just ask him all these questions. So it's definitely important to know who you're working with and uh, what their expectations are beforehand because you never know what you're going to get into. When it comes to building these relationships with these groups of people, at what point do you recommend your clients to start building these types of relationships? Now, before they have deals. So ideally, your job, if you're even thinking about becoming a syndicator, is to go out and meet as many people as you can and start developing a database of prospective investors that might be interested in investing with you later on when you do have a deal. And then taking the time to go through these kinds of questions, these qualification questions, and uh, asking them, you know, whether they you know, meet the criteria or you know, figuring out whether you want to make your deals. Awesome. So, at some point, you may have to offer a private placement memorandum or you know, issue this, and along with subscription agreements. Could you just kind of go through those documents and what they are? Yeah. So, when you get a deal under contract, or you know, there's, so there's several different kinds of deals you can do. You can have, a, say, a commercial property under contract, and you've got to close in 90 days. And you need to raise money for the down payment and the closing costs, and uh, you know, maybe pay yourself an acquisition fee, reimburse yourself for any due diligence expenses, uh, pre-accounting fees, legal fees, those kinds of things. Those are very common. Uh, we call those specified offerings. So that's when you're raising money for a specific deal. Or you might be setting up a fund. Maybe you're doing single family fix and flips, or you want to buy multiple. You have some experience with a particular asset class and you want to be able to go out and buy multiple properties in that asset class. Then uh, that would be another reason that you, know, you would then hire a securities attorney to help you draft the appropriate documents, select the exemption. First, we're going to go through a series of questions with you, figure out what you want to do, where you think your investors are from, what kind of financial qualifications you think they have, whether or not this is your first deal or your your, fifth deal. We're going to help you select the appropriate exemption. And then once we know which exemption it is, then we'd be able to um, suggest what the appropriate offering documents are going to be. But very typically, a set of offering documents for a securities offering is going to include a private placement memorandum. And that's the disclosure document. Uh, The content of that is actually prescribed by the SEC very, very much so. I mean, even down to the fact that they tell you exactly what has to be on the cover page for that document. So they, you know, and very specifically, you know, asking for information about who are the principals and all the beneficial owners in the management and all the different ways that they're getting compensated so we have to disclose all of that information to investors. So we're using that private placement memorandum to tell the story of the investment. So who's in it? Who's involved in management? What are you buying? How long are you going to keep it? What kind of uh, returns are you anticipating? And you know what happens when you do get some cash? How does that get distributed? You know, usually there's something called a waterfall that describes the order that cash is distributed to investors, you know, between the management class and the the, uh, cash paying investors. There may be some fees associated with management of the asset. So all of that stuff is described. And then there's a whole big section on all the different risks of investing in real estate in general, 
with your company in that particular asset class, maybe that particular geographic location, all of those things. Um, We describe any conflicts of interest that exist. So all of those things go into the private placement memorandum. The private placement memorandum is really designed to shift the risk of loss from you, from the syndicator to the investor. So without that document, you don't shift that risk. The syndicator will retain that risk because when you're selling securities, you have an obligation to give the investors all of the information they need to make informed consent. And that's what the PPM is designed to do. So without that document, investors can later complain, hey, I wouldn't have invested if I'd known that. And uh, so if you didn't give them a PPM, that's going to fall back on you. So that's the PPM. The other side of the uh, securities aspects of this is that you have to have a subscription agreement. So the subscription agreement is kind of the flip side of the PPM. This is where the investor tells you about themselves. And they assert to you that they've read all of the documents you provided. They've asked all the questions they had. They've gotten all the answers they wanted. They've sought outside investing advice to the extent they thought it necessary. They understand the risks and they can afford to lose the money. And uh, they're willing to invest anyway, even knowing all of those things. So then they will sign that. And uh, for a 506B offering, they would actually be filling out a questionnaire explaining why they're sophisticated and uh, why they uh, meet the criteria to be in that offering. Um, so that's a subscription agreement. But the third part, so it's kind of like, you know, you're building a sandwich, right? You got these two pieces of bread on the outside. Those are your securities com- compliance aspects. In the middle, you got the meat of the deal. This is your investor contract. So you're going to have to have some contract with your investors. It's either going to be some kind of a company that you're forming. It could be a limited partnership, corporation. Most likely it's going to be an LLC if you're buying real estate. And that document is going to describe how you're going to govern that company from start to finish. You know, Some overlap with what the PPM has, but the PPM is really what you use while you're raising the money. Once you start operations, you're relying on the operating agreement. If there's ever a dispute, you're going to have to go to the operating agreement. And the manager can only do the things that the operating agreement says. If it doesn't say it, they can't do it. So that's where you really want to describe the rights and duties of the management and the members and uh, you know who gets to decide what and what has to happen before people get paid, property sold, etc. So that's kind of how that works. Thank you for explaining that to us. I'm sure that's going to benefit a lot of people out there who have a lot of questions on how those aspects of a deal works. You know, a lot of questions we get from our clients is often how how do you structure one of these things entity wise? And people always ask us for assistance on this. And you know, I was browsing your website, uh, syndicationattorneys.com, and there's a ton of great content out there. So anybody listening wants to learn more about this stuff, definitely go check it out. But how do you recommend structuring? these types of deals from an entity perspective? I know there's various different ways you can do it. And I know you guys explained some of those. Yeah. So um, yeah, you're right. On our website, there's some articles and there's one on uh, kind of a typical deal structure for a syndicate. So that'd be a good one for people to read. But in general, for a specified offering where you're buying a single property, you're going to create a title holding entity. It's going to be manager managed. So let's say if we're going to use an LLC, which would be the most common, then you would form a manager-managed LLC. That LLC is going to take title to the property and be the borrower on the loan. And then the manager itself is probably going to be a separate LLC that is going to be comprised of multiple people who are involved in putting the whole syndicate together. So that's, you know, that's kind of how that's structured. The management level of the LLC can either be member-managed if you have two or three people that are all kind of working in tandem or it could be manager managed if uh, maybe only one or two people are going to be calling the shots and then the other people are just going to be providing services. Within that uh, the kind of the investor level LLC, uh, the one that takes title to the property, there's usually going to be a couple classes of members. The class A members are usually going to be your cash paying investors. And then the other class is, could be class B, you know, could be called something else, but um, class B members are going to be the members that are providing services to the company. So that's usually going to be reserved for your management class. So the management class is going to typically retain a portion of the ownership interests in that uh, title holding entity and sell off a portion of it to the investors who are going to put up all the cash needed to close the deal. So just as an example, you might sell off 70% of the interest to your class A members 
and then keep 30% for the class B members, which is the management. And then as you earn profits, then those profits would be split between class A and class B. In addition, the manager entity itself could also earn certain fees if you have them written into your documents. Thank you for explaining that. Um, when it comes to the tax aspects of it, I understand, you know, in that same article you wrote and something we recommend people do as well, um, the GP, the general partners need to actually contribute some form of capital into the entity to make their gain consider a capital gain rather than ordinary income. Is there anything special people need to do from a legal aspect to do that? Or is that just simply they just have to contribute that capital? Yeah, we usually write it so that the class B members actually can contribute a thousand dollars in total for whatever percent of the interest they keep to establish that cost basis. Awesome. So at what point should syndicators or someone who needs a securities uh, offering get in touch with you to start this process? Uh, well, uh, if you're buying a commercial property, I would recommend that you have a signed purchase and sale agreement that uh, someone from your team has physically visited the site and you've completed your financial analysis. That doesn't mean you've completed your entire lease audit or anything like that, but those three things are things you should do as early on as possible. And uh, you know, maybe even before you get to the signed purchase and sale agreement when you can, but if not, do those first before you spend any other money because I've, I've been involved in writing uh, over 300 uh, securities offerings. And in my experience, uh, both my own personal experience and the experience of my clients, if you get past those three things, the signed purchase and sale agreement, site visit, financial analysis, you're probably 95% likely to close on that deal. And the rest of what you're doing in your due diligence could become uh, maybe deal negotiation if you find something you didn't anticipate. So you might want to ask for a seller credit or something like that instead of uh, you know, just walking away from the deal. And the reason that I say to hire us or contact us when you get to that point is because it, it can take three to four weeks to get your offering documents completed. And we should be working on your documents at the same time that you're out completing the rest of your due diligence. And that would give you the maximum time to be able to still raise money, close the deal, and you're going to be raising the money at the same time your lender is processing your loan. So ideally, you want to have 90 days to close. If you can't get that, get 60 with a 30-day extension and uh, you know, negotiate that extension up front because if you can negotiate it up front, it's going to cost you a lot less than it will if you try to negotiate it a week before closing. So you know, try to keep it as painless as possible. Give yourself a good 90 days. That will give you a comfort zone that you can get the documents done, that the lender can process the loan, and you still have time to uh, do all of your due diligence and uh, bring get your investors in line. Great, great. So it seems like you have to actually have a serious deal in hand. You just don't want to be going speaking to attorneys when you're putting in offers. Wait till you a little bit further down the process. You know, the LOIs, you know, it's really a numbers game. You you got to send out a lot of LOIs in order to get a few of them to uh, get negotiated and, uh, you know, one or two of them to stick. So, you know, don't get excited every time you send an LOI. Just send out as many as you can and eventually one will stick. Awesome. Yep. Yeah, it's definitely what you have to do. I know that when I was looking for my first deal, I had to send out a lot of different offerings and stuff before I finally got something that stuck. So definitely wouldn't want to start talking to attorneys paying fees too early. Um, do you have any horror stories or any issues that people ran into that you've seen that you could have fixed if someone would have done the right thing first, legal-wise? Yeah. You know, I get a lot of clients, some of my more sophisticated clients start bringing in private equity partners. And private equity partners is kind of a sticky business because there's a couple different ways that they'll come into your deal. They'll either take a preferred position above all of your other investors, or they'll take a joint venture position with your syndicate. So maybe your syndicate raises half the money and then they come in for the other half the money. It costs a lot in legal fees to set these up. But if they're set up incorrectly, first of all, you and your investors need to very clearly understand the additional risk that you're bringing into the deal by bringing in a private equity partner, because they are never going to come in and put their money in the deal unless they know they're going to get paid first. And then if the property doesn't perform, they can either force you to sell it or they can take it over. And, you know, so that does happen and you have to be aware of that and make sure that you really understand what you're getting into before you do it. And I always say that if you're getting into a joint venture with a private equity partner, hire us uh, while you're negotiating the memorandum of understanding, not after it's already negotiated. After it's negotiated, all we can do is look at their documents and you know explain to you what it means. 
before it's negotiated, we can maybe help you uh, get some better terms. The other thing that's a really big red flag, and a lot of people do this, is where new syndicators do, is you know everybody wants to raise money from home in their pajamas without uh, going out and actually talking to people. <laughs> you know, so they start chasing whales and uh, finding people that are like, oh, I've got $50 million. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've heard uh, of the Saudi Arabian prince with $50 million or the Chinese person who has $50 million. And it's always $50 million. You know, you have to be careful of those people or people that say that they're, they're those people because they're probably not for real. If you're dealing with non-US investors, you should only deal with people that you actually know. If you're dealing with big fish investors, uh, make sure you know them very well because they are notorious for leaving you hanging at the altar, you know, stringing you along, stringing you along, and then deciding that they don't want to do the deal after you've spent a bunch of money to get to where you are and it's too late to raise the money any other way. So if you get a whale investor, you know, I always say, think of the movie Moby Dick, <laughs> whales leave a wake of destruction in their path sometimes and uh, don't let yourself get caught up in that. Keep raising money. If more money you raise, fifty or hundred thousand dollars at a time, will allow you to keep control of your deal. It will give you the track record and experience that you need to be able to go on and to grow your syndication business. And it will be far less painful to deal with than trying to deal with uh, whale investors that uh, you know kind of leave you hanging or renegotiate terms at the end and leave you in a, a bad position. So it sounds like this is largely a you know, relationship-based business. And when it comes to raising money, you really want to make sure you have a solid relationship and a solid understanding um, with your potential investors on how things are going to work and what the expectations are before getting into business with them and, and then being stuck in that type of relationship. When you work with your clients, what do you recommend they do? How do you recommend they handle their accounting and taxes? Do you give any recommendations to them at all? Um, well, I recommend that they always find an experienced CPA that understands group investments. Uh, if they're dealing with investors who are non-U.S. persons, they need to make sure that that CPA has experience with international investments. Um, you know, there's just so many pitfalls that you can get into. Uh, and it never hurts to have your CPA look at your documents up front to make sure that you're not stepping into, you know, something that you weren't aware of. You just really need to have good tax planning advice. Awesome. If you did have to pick one piece of tax advice that you ever received, whether it be in real estate or just in business in general, what would be your top tax advice that you ever received? That I ever received? Um, I can't say that I have the top piece of advice that I've ever received, but I can tell you that I've made some serious tax mistakes in my own investment. And the worst mistake I ever made was in a development project and not understanding the difference between inventory and capital gains and uh, you know and how the IRS was going to treat all of that so you've got to be careful there's also some very significant nuances when you're investing in a development project say in a joint venture you know where one of the partners is putting up all the work and one of them is putting up all the money that requires some very careful tax planning uh, or it can leave uh, some of the uh, the more active partners in a, in, a, in a position where you know they've got taxes and but they don't have distributions and so it's something that's critical that you get that figured out. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, one thing we always uh, recommend, uh, you know, t we tell our our clients is that if you're going to be flipping properties, you're going to be developing properties, you could be sometimes classified as a dealer. And when you're classified as a dealer, your profits will be taxed as ordinary income and not as capital gains, which are you know at the lower rate. So if you're doing anything like that, you definitely want to consult with your advisors to make sure that you know you're aware of what taxes you're going to have to pay. So before we wrap this up, what's your favorite piece of tech that you're using currently in your business? Hmm. Well, I'll have to say that we've used Dropbox for 10 years and it's just been fantastic. But I will, well, actually, and I'll say there's a new one that we've just started using that I like, I like a lot. It's called Asana, A-S-A-N-A. -A. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's a project management software. And we've looked for a long time, uh, you know, and tried to do the spreadsheets and all that stuff just to manage the projects internally in our law firm. And, uh, you know, there's uh, seven of us working on things all the time and, you know, different team members and trying to get stuff out the door and, and all of that. So um, we found Asana and uh, we're pretty happy with that right now. Awesome. Never heard of that, but I'm going to have to look that up. Uh, sounds like interesting software for project management. Uh, I know we just recently got one but uh, always taking a look for that new and latest tech and what's going to work the best. Um, if our audience wanted to get in touch with you, what is the best way for them to do that? 
Um, the best way would be go to our website, syndicationattorneys.com, and you can schedule a free consultation. Usually that's going to be initially with our law clerk uh, and she'll try to either help you or figure out if you need to speak to an attorney, um, she can get you in touch with one of us. Then, uh, you know, that's the best way to get on our calendar. Thanks for listening to today's show. If you enjoyed the show, please find us on iTunes and leave us a review. You can also email us at contact at therealestatecpa.com with any feedback or topic suggestions. We are always taking on new clients and with the new tax laws in play, you really don't want to navigate this alone. Let us help you save money on taxes and with your accounting and CFO needs. To become a client, navigate to our client page at therealestatecpa.com and fill out a web form with as much detail about your situation as possible. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great rest of your week.